everybody, how is it going? Roger says, hey. Scarlet says, hey, she's under the desk. So we're continuing on with the Great Wars series today, but we've got something a little different. <laughs> So I have been going through the chronological playlist on the Great War channel for uh, this, this series, and I have seen just like these more random videos kind of mixed in there that have to do with uh, certain aspects of the war, and they're not about like the week-to-week -week battles and overall strategy. And I did have an intention to go back and do these videos, but I thought that maybe it would take us a little bit too far off track and I should maybe just stick to the week to week ones. But then I got a message from one of my patrons this past week. It's from Joel Pieters, SN7. And he just said, just curious, when you're reacting to the Great War channel, do you use their week by week playlist? Because since you express interest in their other videos and the ones that talk about tech, individual countries, etc., I would recommend the chronological order playlist by them as it helps with when they will touch on these topics in relation to the normal episodes that you watch. So since Joel sent that message to me, it kind of like reiterated maybe it would be really important for me to go back and watch some of these special episodes that they do in this playlist. And I think he's absolutely right. I think it would be good to fill in some of these knowledge gaps and they will touch on some of these questions that I've had. Like for instance, the next one that we're gonna watch, it touches on the role of planes and uh, the cavalry in World War One, which were things that I was really hoping to kind of learn more about. So I definitely wanna go back and watch these uh, videos to kind of get some more information on some of these subjects. So don't worry, I am gonna be continuing with the week by week stuff, but I do wanna spend a couple of videos here going back and catching up on some of these special topics. And the one we're gonna watch today is called Are Those Insane Austrian Railways Still in Use? And it's from a series called Out of the Trenches, it looks like, on this channel. So Indy 9 dale has put some emphasis on the railway systems and how important they were for transporting troops and goods around. And I believe it was the uh, Austrian railway system that was really, really uh, advanced for this time. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at some of the railway systems and the role that they played in World War One. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to the Great War. You guys have written us a lot of questions since we started doing this show about the war and about things that we might not have discussed in the episode. And today's little special is for me to answer some of your questions. Unboxing John asks, are those insane different tracks railways still in use? This is a really good question because I didn't actually know the answer to this question. So I looked it up. And even just checking Wikipedia for Austrian railways, I saw that all of Austrian's neighboring countries now use the same gauge railways as Austria. But I did notice that Hungary and the Ukraine have different gauges from each other still. Now, the narrow gauge railways that we talked about in Bosnia and in Serbia that were, you know, such a big mess during World War I were all pretty much closed or replaced by the end of the 1970s. But still, for like 50 years, they were pretty much using them. Fraud asks, why did Portugal join? You know what, I don't really know anything about railways and different gauges. I, I didn't even know that there were different gauges for railways, and why does that matter? Like, what, is the, what, are the, what does the width of the gauges have to do with, with anything, I guess? Maybe are the thicker gauge, what it, what it, actually, what is measuring the gauge? Is it the, um, the rails themselves that are on top of the different, uh, I don't know. I don't know what the, the parts are called for a railway, but you know, the different, uh, the width of the rail, is that what the gauge is that they're talking about? And I'm assuming that the the wider it is, the like more stable it is, maybe so, or better made it is. It's probably more expensive though to to do that. So I guess if you're a country that doesn't have as much money or resources to uh, to build, maybe a wider gauge uh, railway, then then you're gonna have a slightly inferior railway system, maybe. Maybe more accidents happen. Fraud asks, why did Portugal join the war at all? Did they get anything out of it? Portugal officially joined the war when Germany declared war on her in May 1916. But even though she was neutral, she had been pretty up in the air since the outbreak of hostilities in 1914, mainly because of the Portuguese colonies, Mozambique and Angola in Africa. They, their border was with German Southwest Africa. And the Germans wanted to use that border to bring you know, material to the German troops to fight the English. And Portugal was opposed to this. And one big reason was that Britain was Portugal's most important market. 
And also, the U-boat warfare off the English coast was messing with Portuguese shipping, so Portugal had several reasons to be down on Germany. Now, eventually, uh, in 1916, Portugal interned three dozen German and Austrian ships in Lisbon upon British request, and Germany responded... I mean, <laughs> they're packed onto that ship like sardines. Are you serious? Oh my gosh. Can't imagine being one of those guys. Like, that had to be really uncomfortable. I mean, I don't know. Maybe they're just all packed for the, for the photo and they're not actually that crowded on the ship, but still, that must have been... Uncomfortable. Dozen German and Austrian ships in Lisbon upon British request, and Germany responded by declaring war. So about 7,000 Portuguese troops died in the war, and as to your question, what they got out of the whole thing was the port of Kiango, which is now part of Tanzania. However, something you did not ask, but something I will tell you anyway, is that this was a great move for Britain, as she could now use the Portuguese Atlantic islands, like Madeira and the Cape Verde Islands, as bases to fight German raids of commercial shipping in the Atlantic. That's the short version. You have to wait a few years to get the long one. Flesh okay. asks... You know, this is the aspect of World War One that I had no clue about, was all of the fighting that was going down in Africa. Um, I don't know if you call them a proxy war or not, if that's the right term for it, but you have the colonies fighting each other in Africa as well. It's just something I was completely unaware of. I think mainly because the United States doesn't have the same history in Africa, uh, the same colonial history in Africa as a lot of the European countries do. So it's just not even a thought in our minds, really, um, having a presence in Africa. Now, I know that we, you know, had the whole, like, we took slaves from Africa and stuff, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, like, actually establishing colonies and stuff in Africa, like, uh, you know, Germany and Poland and, you know, Britain and, you know, all of these countries did. So that's a, another really interesting aspect of this that I'm learning about. In the Atlantic. That's the short version. You have to wait a few years to get the long one. Flesh asks, was Paris ever leveled? Nope, never leveled. Paris was bombed, first by German Zeppelins in the early part of the war, and then at the end of the war by the big Bertha guns and then the Paris guns. But compared to most of northern France, you know, during the war, in the war zones, Paris got off lightly. In fact, much more damage was done to Paris in the Franco-Prussian War back in 1870. Now, the Paris guns in 1870 shelled Paris from 120 kilometers away, though not effectively at all. And here's a little piece of trivia. The shells from the Paris guns were the first man-made objects to reach the stratosphere. True story. Arbiter 567 Wait, asks, are the what? Man-made objects to reach the 120 kilometers away, though not effectively at all. And here's a little piece of trivia. The shells from the Paris guns were the first man-made objects to reach the stratosphere. True story. Arbiter okay, 5 but how high is the stratosphere, though? Is that, like, up near orbit, or is... I mean, surely... Surely it's not that tall, is it? Or that high? Okay, the stratosphere is the second layer of the atmosphere of Earth located above the troposphere and below the mesosphere. It's like right below where you start seeing space, basically. <laughs> it looks like the, the line between the stratosphere and the mesosphere is where you start seeing kind of like the the edge of the atmosphere and you can see a little bit of space. Okay, so stratosphere, not quite up to orbit level, but pretty high. For the first man-made objects to reach the stratosphere. True story. Arbiter 567 asks, are these actual films or later recreations? Is the sound added? These are the actual films we use. We have an agreement with the British Pathé Film Archives to use their original war footage for our series. And you can check out their war archive channel right here. Now, the sound has been added later since it was another 15 years before films could be recorded with sound. Timid One asks, why wouldn't the French take a machine gun into account? Not just the French. It was the British, too. <laughs> this when was Hiram my question. When developed his first machine gun, he offered it to the British, and they didn't want it. And partly because it was not a proper weapon. See, the romantic war mentality was still really evident in the early weeks of the war. You wore bright colors, you waved a oh saber, and you, you marched en masse to a big marching band. You know, that's what war was. And it sounds insane now, marching towards machine guns, but there you have it. When the war began, the Germans had around 12,000 machine guns. The British and French had maybe a few hundred derivatives. But to be fair, in their colonial battles, which were the only kind the British or the French had fought for two generations, they had never needed machine guns. They, they didn't get modern war at all. The British didn't even create a machine gun corps till October 1915. The French battle plan at the outbreak of the war had a big basis in 
fighting spirit, and offensive mobility. So much so that capable guys like General Lanzarac were dismissed for being too cautious. But the French just didn't realize that defensive technology on the field was now way ahead of offensive technology. And machine guns were pretty much entirely defensive until late in the war when they could make more portable models. Wait, FM Lamarck asked, machine guns were defensive? Okay. That's backwards from what I thought, you know, because I, I think of machine guns as being an offensive weapon. Like, you're on the attack, like, majorly on the, atta on the attack because of just the speed at which the bullets are flying out at the enemy. To me, that's an offensive tactic, not a defensive tactic. But I can understand maybe why it's defensive, because if you have the army running at you, then you're using the machine gun as a defense to keep them, you know, at bay. So I can understand that, too. Fairly defensive until late in the war when they could make more portable models. F.M. Lamarck asks, Will we look into colonial conflicts? For example, the German raids on neutral Portuguese and Belgian... Okay, so the portability of it makes it a defensive or offensive. If you can't... If it's a really big, heavy gun, machine gun, then I guess you would have to just plop it down and you can't really move it around. And so, because you can't move, it's more of a defensive weapon at, at that point. But offensive, it would become offensive when they're able to kind of move them around more. Okay, that makes a little bit more sense. F.M. Lamarck asks, Will we look into colonial conflicts, for example, the German raids on neutral Portuguese and Belgian colonies in Africa in 1914? Yes. Yes. <laughs> all right, well, that was all for today. I hope you guys enjoyed that and you learned something. All right, well, I did learn something, definitely. That was a really interesting video. It wasn't too long, but it was cool getting to uh, see some people asking the same questions that I had in some of my videos and having them answered. It was also, you know, kind of cool to see uh, Indy Nidal doing the same thing that I do for uh, my comment time that I do on my videos for this series anyway. But for my comment time, it is you guys answering my questions, not me answering your questions. So very good video. I think the next one, again, is going to be on uh, kind of the role of planes and cavalry in World War One. So we might do that one next and then get to weeks 13 and 14. So hope you guys uh, stay tuned for all of that stuff. Appreciate you guys watching. Also, if you enjoy my videos, I'd also appreciate a like and a subscribe. And you can also find the links to my social media, Discord, and Patreon in the description and the pinned comment. I am doing the World of War series on Patreon from 1973. If you guys are interested in watching those things, those things are like an hour long. I'm doing all 26 episodes over on Patreon. So if that's something that you're interested in, you might want to go check it out. But anyway, Roger, Scarlett, and I thank you guys for watching. As always, we'll see you next time.